I'd like to call the 23rd regular meeting of the 2019-2020 Common Council to order. Would the clerk please read the quote for the day? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do what you can with what you've got where you are. Thank you very much. Today for the Pledge of Allegiance, um, we will have some special guests. The Boys and Girls Clubs of Sheboygan County held uh, the 2020 Arts and Leadership Showcase on February 6th at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center. This event was a free community celebration of creativity and character. The club kids displayed specially selected artwork and performance skills. They also announced the Youth of the Year and their ambassadors who are chosen for outstanding character and leadership. Tonight, I'm pleased to welcome the Boys and Girls Kids Leadership Ambassadors for 2020, who will lead the Pledge of Allegiance. They are Eliana Robinson and Jackson Ponoth. Uh, they are accompanied by Executive Director Christina Singh and Andrew, Andrew Jacobs, the club director. Please join us at the front of the room here for um, the pledge. First of all, I'd like to give you some information about these leaders. Eliana L.A. Robinson is a 12-year-old, uh, sixth grade student at Farnsworth Middle School. Eliana represents the Boys and Girls Clubs of Sheboygan County as the 2020 Junior Youth Leader of the Year. Ellie has been involved with the club since 2013. Staff member Bailey Harrington has this to say about her. Ellie is kind to all people around her, treats her peers with respect, takes her academics seriously, and uses her talents to serve others, and always has a smile on her face. We're proud of the great impact that Ellie makes and will continue to make in the world around her. Congratulations. And Jackson Ponath is a 14-year-old eighth grade student from St. Paul's Lutheran Middle School. Jackson is here representing the Boys and Girls Clubs of Sheboygan County as their 2020 Youth Leader of the Year. Yeah, Youth Leader of the Year is a major accomplishment for any member and for Jackson it has been well earned as well. With over 600 hours spent in the club last year, Jackson has had the opportunity to practice leadership through multiple community service opportunities. He also served as a, in a vital role at the club as the YMCA Keystone Leadership Club. His club director has this to say about Jackson. What continuously impresses me about Jackson is his willingness to serve. He's always the first person to volunteer to help and the last to throw in the towel at the end of the job. Jackson is grateful that the club provides a place for him to grow in knowledge and ability with the support of caring adults who always push him to do his best. So with that, would you everyone please stand and would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My thanks to the Boys and Girls Club of Sheboygan County where they strive to improve the lives of every kid who walks through their doors. Together with their donors, volunteers, and partner agencies, they do whatever it takes to build great futures for kids. And it's nice to meet the two of you tonight. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, approval of the minutes from our last council meeting. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 If you opposed, motion passes. Next is mayor's appointments. I'll turn it over to city uh, attorney Charles Adams. Uh, 1.4 is uh, an appointment by the mayor submitting the following appointment for your consideration. Um, Marlo Testweed to be considered for appointment to the Harbor Center Business Improvement District Board to fill a vacancy with the term expiring on December 31, 2021. That will lie over. 1.5 is also an appointment by the mayor submitting the following appointment for your consideration. James Owen to be considered for appointment to the Redevelopment Authority to fill the unexpired term of Matt Quashes, whose term expires April 20, 2020. That also lays over. And 1.6, uh, the mayor hereby submits the following appointment for your consideration. Charlie Wick to be considered for appointment to the Architectural Review Board to fill the unexpired term of Ray Hain, whose term expires April 20, 2020. That also lays over. 
Next is a presentation. Uh, Sheboygan Police Chief Chris Domogolski is going to be presenting the department's 2019 annual report. Chief? Thanks for the opportunity to uh, share a little bit about the work of the police department uh, for the last year. Um, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to lead the police department and to work with all of you to make Sheboygan a great place um, to live. Um, okay, here we go, I think. So to start out with, I'd just like to really tell you where, where we're coming from. And so our vision as a police department for the last 10 years has been to be the safest community of its size in the United States. So it's a big lofty goal. Um, we're not afraid to take on big goals and, and set big goals and work to accomplish them. So that's what it's about. Our mission is to be the model of excellence in policing by working in partnership with the community and others to fight crime, the fear of crime and disorder, to enforce laws, while safeguarding the constitutional rights of all people, to provide quality service to all of our residents and visitors, and to create a work environment in which we recruit, train, and develop an ex exceptional team of employees. Um, so as you can see, it, it really encompassing, encompasses everything. It's understanding that, that really the key to our success is the employees that, that work for us and that we have to give them the tools and support them so that they can, they can be successful. It's also understanding that that it's not just crime, but the fear of crime that really creates issues in, in neighborhoods and in cities, and really um, trying to take care of that disorder so that, that people feel comfortable in, in getting out of their houses and interacting and really creating community in our city. So I'm going to start right out with um, what crime looks like. So we have part one crimes for the last 10 years up there, um, and really I would point you to, to two things, and, and I don't want you to get too hung up on this, but I think it's, it's somewhat dramatic. If you looked in, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see total part one crimes for 2009, 2006. And if you look at in the lower right-hand corner for 2019, total part one crimes for 2019 is 911. And what that equates to is a 55% decrease over that 10-year period. Um, I can pull out more numbers for you if you're really interested because in, in the 1990s the numbers are even higher. And so this is one of the things that we face both as, as a community and as a nation. Um, with the way we share information nowadays, it, it creates fear and, and doesn't necessarily um, give reality to what's going on in our cities and in our communities. And so why we have crime problems, the crime problems today are much less than they've been in the past, and there's lots of reasons for those. And I'm going to try to talk to you about, about some of them. Um, so I think one of the things that would, would jump out at you is our assault number. So it's 109 for aggravated assaults in, in 2019, and so that's higher than it was in, in 2009. Um, uh, and I think that's important because just looking at the numbers and not putting in in context makes you think that, that things are, are really out of control. But there's lots of reasons that that happens. N number one is laws change, and so things get classified differently as time goes on. And also, one of our goals is to be the model of excellence, which means that we're always looking at what we're doing, what knowledge that there is about policing and victimization and medical issues and everything that surrounds the work that we do and try to figure out how to get better at that. So of those 109 aggravated assaults that we investigated in 2019, 93% of those cases, the victims and the suspects knew each other. 17% um, were family members and the other 76% were acquaintances. So only about 7%, very small, small number of those incidents are, are their strangers. So the danger isn't going out and walking at night and, and getting abducted or assaulted by some stranger walking down the street. The, 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 the real danger in, in our community is in our families and, and in our relationships. Um, of those 109, 50% of them are domestic abuse incidents. 
And this is probably underreported, but 33% involve either the use or abuse of alcohol and drugs. And so that's an underlying theme, not only in our, in our community, but really our state. Um, so I talked about uh, us figuring out um, things that we don't know and becoming uh, more aware of what's going on. And so one of those uh, illustrations that I would provide to you is, is strangulation and domestic violence. So I can tell you that 10 years ago when I came here, we, wouldn't, we would have known very little about strangulation. So strangulation is when somebody puts their, their hands around somebody's throat and squeeze and constrict and, and stop the blood flow and oxygen from getting to the brain. And so that when, when an officer shows up on a scene and they're investigating that, they're not going to see um, evidence of that. Um, so very underreported in the past, but through research, we've come to understand the importance of strangulation because there's a direct correlation with lethality. So we know that in those domestic violence um, situations um, that, that result in homicide, strangulation is one of the key factors um, that would lead us to, to understand that that escalation is going to happen. And so we've worked with um, our countywide group, the DART team, domestic um, abuse response team, um, to develop best practices and train our officers so that they know to ask these questions, um, so that they can identify these. They have a lethality form that they fill out and that we share with our partners so that not only we know that, that this is a high dangerous and, and lethal uh, relationship and that it, there needs to be an intervention, but, but um, our, all of our system partners know, the district attorney's offices, the judges, the advocates, the service providers, they all get that information so we can take whatever opportunities we can to try to intervene in those cases. Um, and so I guess the big point that I'm making here is not only have we improved the services that we're delivering to the community, but also there's going to be an increase in those numbers because we're recognizing things that we didn't recognize in the past, and we're trying to intervene to stop that from happening um, in further situations. Um, of the 109 cases last year, five of them involved a firearm, and only one of those involved a stranger. So um, our gun crime is, is very low in this community. Now I'm just going to um, throw some outputs at you so that you understand really what's happening um, in, in the background with some of the work that we did or do. So a number that's not on there, but our total open record requests that we processed in 2019 was 6,546 open records requests. So it's something that, that's growing and something that, that we spend a lot of time doing. Um, part of that is you'll see um, there's was 197 re open records requests just for digital files. And so as we enter the digital world, that's something that we've taken on and, and something that's going to continue to be a big obstacle for us. Obviously, there's, there's lots of benefits to it. And so we've gotten body cams. And I know that the narrative behind body cams was it was going to catch the police doing all kinds of bad things. But really, really, the the, the, the truth is, is that it helps us collect evidence and provide better cases to the district attorney and city attorney, um, and it helps them resolve those issues faster. Um, discovery requests for, for digital evidence, we had 1,326 just last year, um, and we've provided uh, mostly to the district attorney's office, but 8,975 digital files, uh, mostly body cam video to them. So lots of processing there. We've worked very hard to try to streamline the process so that there's less work involved. Um, but it's going to be something that we're going to have to continue to deal with. In the lower left-hand corner, forensic, down, uh, forensic phone downloads. Last year we did 992. So as everybody is now carrying a computer around with them everywhere they go, that piece of equipment is becoming more and more important to, in our criminal cases and requiring us um, to do lots more work, not only downloading phones, but really the bigger key then is spending the time going through all of the information um, that we download to figure out what's evidence or what might in, uh, impact a case one way or the other. Um, I think one of the, the, one of the challenges for us um, is to set clearer guidelines, not of what we do 
process which phones we do, but rather which ones we don't, because the, the chance to do it is just so great that we're going to have to put limits on it, or we'll never have anybody out on the street doing any work. On the bottom right-hand corner there, there's a number 84 child interviews at the Child Advocacy Center. So again, this is us recognizing best practice and how to better deal with victims and provide them a, a better path forward um, for healing and those kinds of things. So the Child Advocacy Center um, is located in Sockville and it's the three counties that, that share it. Sheboygan, Ozaki, and Washington County. Sheboygan Police Department is the largest user of the Child Advocacy Center and they provide um, child forensic in interviews and so what what this means is essentially they have experts that are conducting the interviews for us we want to only conduct one interview not multiple interviews to reduce the level of trauma on our victims and then they're going to um, videotape it so that it can be used in court they also provide medical exams so children that are assaulted they have experts that they work with um, from children's hospital that are there that help give medical exams gather and gather evidence they have advocacy so we work with safe harbor safe harbor is a partner um, with them and they provide advocates for all of our child cases and our sexual assaults so that there's somebody there supporting the victim and, and helping them get to um, available resources and then the child advocacy center um, also helps provide mental health services where it's needed. Um, so just a couple other things that I would mention here. Um, last year, um, with, with not only the opioid, but really the drug issue that we have, we collected 1,589 pounds of prescription drugs. We responded to 26 non-fatal overdoses. We administered Narcan seven times to those victims, and we investigated 12 fatal overdoses from either opiates or meth methamphetamine, or often what we call polydrug, so multiple different drugs that they overdosed on. Uh, we participate um, not only in setting up the drug treatment court, but also as a key team member. We're involved in the Sheboygan County Veterans Treatment Court. Um, we're part of um, Healthy Sheboygan County 2020. And we've in instituted a DEC program, um, which is a, a it, it's a drug recognition for children program. So anytime that we respond to a scene and there's drugs that are recovered in the house, um, essentially where children could have access to them, we work with the Child Advocacy Center to get them tested to make sure that that if they have exposure to those drugs that we can provide them the services to, um, to go forward from there. And that's a partnership um, with Health and Human Services. So this I'm just throwing up here. So the number 25,379 is the total number of law incidents. So this is incidents that we respond to where we um, have a need really to document significant information there. So this is just a snapshot of the number of calls that we respond to. Um, so it's the actual number of interactions that with people um, that we have is much greater than that, but I think it's a good benchmark. And, and then the numbers that I'm really contrasting it that I want you to see is our use of force numbers and the key ones would be in red. And so of all the contacts that we had in 2019 with citizens, the only uses of force that we had were eight times we deployed or we used a taser on a, a subject that we were taking them into custody. So eight times, it's not something that's happening every day. Um, six times we employed active countermeasures and that would be um, punching, kicking, using a knee strike, something like that to overcome somebody's resistance. So six times we did that. And then three times we deployed um, OC or ole oleoresin capsicum spray to try to overcome their resistance. And then at the top, there was one use of deadly force and that happened um, when one of our officers who's on the Marshall's task force um, was in Ashland, Wisconsin with the Marshall's task force trying to arrest a, a fugitive that was wanted from the state of Oregon and he armed himself with a rifle and, and got in his car and tried to drive some of them over. But so I, I think that, again, the narrative that the police are out using force on people all the time um, is, is demonstrated much differently in the information here. The next topic, so any of you that go to a neighborhood meeting, what, what you would hear about is driving and traffic accidents. 
Um, and I would tell you that, that I agree with you that it's a key concern not only of our community but of your police department. And, and what's important is that when we address this issue that we, um, how would I tell you this, that we look at the big picture and do it in a way that we can be effective. And so we have to treat each individual complaint with care and with concern, but we still have to approach this from a big picture um, in order to be successful. If we're just trying to chase every incident, we're not gonna be successful in keeping the numbers down. And so what I would tell you is that today, there's more automobiles on the road in Sheboygan than at any time in the past. Um, people are much more distracted than any time in the past, and people are much more aggressive in a bigger hurry than any time in the past. So the fact that our numbers are as low as they are in comparison to past years, uh, we're not anywhere near where I would want to be, but I think we're, we're demonstrating that, that we are showing care and concern and that we're trying to um, approach it in a reasonable and thoughtful, thoughtful way. And the, the real key here is not how many tickets the police can write, but getting each citizen to show that same care and concern and address it at, at that level. So just some more outputs, um, not to bore you, but to show you some of the, the work that's being done. So we responded to 493 alarms. And, and I just throw that number out because this came up about a year, a year and a half ago. Um, uh, on social media with some people believing that, that we're out of line because we're charging some people after they've had multiple false alarms for that. But of these 493 alarms, I would bet that less than two are an actual crime or a burglary. The rest are all false alarms. So they're all times where we have officers involved on other incidents or involved in other work that we're pulling them away and sending them like an emergency to, to somebody's house or business where there's really nothing going on. Um, abandoned vehicles. Um, we get a lot of abandoned vehicle complaints and there's a lot of people in the city that think that that we don't do anything about them. So we towed 192 vehicles last year. And so we, we do aggressively address it as best as we can. Um, and then the other number that I like to talk about at our committee meetings is on the bottom is our um, what we call Chapter 51 emergency detention. So we did 110 of those last year. And so that's 110 times that we had to intervene and um, restrict somebody's freedom so that they could get mental evaluation and hopefully mental treatment to get them out of the crisis that they were in and, and back um, living in our community. So one of the big challenges that, that we had last year and that we'll continue to have is the people on the top row are the people that, that um, retired last year and left us. And so lots of really good people with lots of, uh, of um, experience and a whole lot of knowledge. And so watching all of that walk out the door um, can be a challenge. But I would tell you it's, it's also an opportunity because you see all of those people under there that come in with um, a lot of can-do attitude and a lot of energy. And so our task is really to channel that and get the most out of it. The other thing that they bring really is um, less resistance to change. So many of the things that we're doing, they're more open to and we can move things forward faster with them. So. Um, you know, I think with, with the number of them that we have new officers on second and third shift, it can be sometimes challenging for citizens to be patient with them and let them work through things. But, but as that goes on and they gain the experience, it's really gonna be um, a positive thing for the city. We've been very lucky in the quality of the people that we've been able to hire over the last couple of years. So one of the things that, that we've learned um, is the stress that, that law enforcement can have on somebody's personal life um, and work life. And so we've tried to do many things within the department to try to A, lessen that, but B, also make sure that um, the resources are in place for the, those that are struggling. Um, and so we've developed a chaplain's program, a peer support program, um, we have EAP in the city, and the program that we did last year is what we called Armor Academy. 
And it's really about um, bringing in family members and significant others of, of the members in our department and sharing with them all the resources that are available. And then also talking to them about what the stressors are in our occupation so that they recognize what's going on. Uh, maybe provide a little bit more patience to their significant other or family member and recognize when something's going on. And also to try to reduce that stigma so that we have family members that are helping them to, to reach out and use the support systems that we've put in place so that, that they can be healthy and, and productive while at work. We've also done uh, a lot of resiliency training and we have um, Matt Walsh who was went through a program, train a trainer for a national resiliency program through the FBI National Academy. And then the last thing I just wanna, or the second last thing I just wanna touch on briefly is, is our work in the neighborhoods. Um, so the neighborhoods are the lifeblood of this city and where everything really starts. Um, and, and this is really important for multiple reasons, but, but the main reason is because without our officers having relationships with our citizens, we're not gonna be successful. And I talked about this wellness piece. Um, when the officers are running call to call, going from disorder and crisis to disorder and crisis, they, they start to really, um, how would I tell you this? They, they start to get crazy in that they start to think that everybody is in crisis and that everybody's crazy. And so we have to provide opportunities where our officers can see that that's not true and that people really are normal and good people. Um, and, and so not only building those relationships for the citizens, but really building those relationships for, for our officers so that they can stay healthy and maintain a healthy relationship with our citizens. So there's just a couple things there about what it looks like, but it also looks like 270 outreach activities last year. It looks like shop with a cop, blue Santa, hop with a cop, brought with a cop, coffee with a cop, cops and bobbers, safety town, citizens academy, just to name a couple. And then lastly, none of this happens um, by the police department alone. It happens um, through all of your support. Um, the support of the Fire and Police Commission, the support of our citizens, and the, the support of individual citizens and businesses who help um, provide funding to make many of these outreach activities um, happen. So thank you very much. The vision that Chris Domogolsky set for our city was to be the safest in, in our size in the United States. As the chief of police, he's built a very strong trust between the community and the Sheboygan Police Department. He created a department that embraces innovation with community policing, neighborhood associations, diversity training, drug and opioid education, officer videos, uh, cameras, uh, data collection analysis and mapping, emergency dispatch consolidation. Chief Kamagalsi has kept this department on the leading edge. These efforts have seen part one crimes reduced, as he said, by over by 55% in the last 10 years. What amazing results. I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to Chief Chris Domogolsky for a job well done, and we wish that you could stay longer, but we understand your desire to look for and accept a new challenge. However, I understand the City of Milwaukee has not yet approved your contract, nor have you given the City of Sheboygan your final notice to leave as Chief of Police, and if anything it goes wrong, we'd love to see you stay longer. <laughs> So I think Administrator Hofflin and the City Council would join me in wishing you all the best in your future, Chris. And we have a certificate of appreciation to Chris Domogolsky for 10 years of dedicated service since January 18th of 2010 as our Chief of Police. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> so I appreciate it. Um,
I, I don't have anything to say right now. It's uh, a pretty uncomfortable time, and until things uh, work out and I know what the path forward is going to be, uh, I'm just going to reserve my comments. But thanks a lot. Uh, City Clerk, do we have anyone for public forum tonight? Not this evening. Thank you. Um, we have a few announcements. Uh, we have a public input meeting uh, for Union Avenue and South 17th Street intersection improvement project. Uh, this will be held on March 3rd from 4 to 5 at the King Park Pavilion. Uh, during uh, the summer of uh, 2020, the city is uh, proposing to install new traffic signals at the intersection of Union Avenue and South Business Drive to create efficiency and safety. As a part of the project, the intersection of South 17th Street and Union will also be reconstructed. This new intersection design will consist of South 17th Street having access as right in and right out only uh, to and from Union Avenue. Uh, the Boots and Sports Complex will be featured on the next uh, Sheboygan County First Friday Forum, which will be held on March 6th. Of, um, at, at, that's a, a Friday, and it's from 11.30 until 1, and this will be held at the Elks Lodge. Uh, Joe Volkner from the uh, Lake Chair United Group will be presenting a project overview and economic impact expectations of the Busan Sports Complex project, which is proposed in partnership with Lake Shore United Soccer Club. Uh, this is an event that you have to RSVP for, and there is a fee for the lunch. And we will also have WSCS uh, taping this, so it'll be available to everyone later on for more uh, information. Uh, daylight savings time starts next weekend. We'll spring ahead uh, for an hour on, on Sunday, March 8th. And remember to use this as an opportunity to check the batteries in your smoke alarms in your home or apartment. There's a Why Should You Care About Pesticides uh, program that's going to be held on March 11th at 6 o'clock to 7.30 at the Mead Library. The Friends of North Point invite you to join them at their winter speaker series to hear guest presenter Dr. Warren Potter of UW-Madison Department of Ingregative Biology. And uh, the 34th annual uh, Flapjack Day is coming up at Maywood on March 15th. Celebrate maple syrup with us. Pancake breakfast featuring Maywood's own maple syrup will be served from 9.30 until 12.30. The advanced tickets are $5 per person or $6 at the door. Kids four and under eat free. For, uh, there are a lot of fun activities from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, including guided tours of the maple forest. And our performance scorecard has been issued for the, the spring of 2020 edition of Sheboygan's performance scorecard is now available. This report helps residents become engaged uh, in our performance reporting program. Residents may view how the city performed in support of the six key focus areas in our strategic plan. A link to the performance scorecard is included in the March issue of the city newsletter, the Sheboygan Insider, which is available on the city website at Sheboygan. WI.gov. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we'll um, go into our, our hearings. <clears throat> Item 2.1 is a hearing uh, number seven of 1920 pursuant to a notice published in the personal notices and sent by the city clerk. There is a hearing scheduled to amend the city of Sheboygan's official zoning map to change the use district classification of property located off of Menning Road from class mixed residential MR8 to class suburban residential SR5 classification. Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to close. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in, in favor of closing the hearing, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Hear, hearing uh, number two is, uh, is actually hearing number eight of 1920, pursuing 
to a notice that was published in the personal notices and sent by the city clerk. There is a hearing scheduled to amend the city of Sheboygan's official zoning map to change the use district classification of property located off of South Business Drive from class suburban residential to class neighborhood commercial. Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to close. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of closing the hearing, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing is closed. Uh, Item 2.3 is hearing number 9 of 1920, pursuant to a notice published in the personal notices and sent by the city clerk. There is a hearing scheduled to amend the city of Sheboygan's official zoning map to change the use district classification of property located off of South Business Drive from class suburban uh, residential. And... in class neighborhood commercial to class mixed residential classification. Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Alderperson Wolf? Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to close. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of closing, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing is closed. Now, I'd just like to point out that usually these zoning changes would be uh, voted on later in our agenda, but because there was some uh, unfinished business with uh, the park in this, uh, this subdivision uh, that's still being debated, we wanted to wait until that was done before voting on these zoning changes so that they all matched whatever plan we came up with. Next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. That'll include items 3.2 through 3.13. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to receive and file all ROs, receive all RCs, and adopt all resolutions and ordinances. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on any of the items in the consent agenda? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Under uh, reports of officers, item 4.1 is RO number 164 of 1920 by the Transit Commission to whom is referred resolution number 173 of 1920 by Alderpersons Wolf and Don Donahue and Sorensen, authorizing the mayor to execute the amended 2020 general contract between Sheboygan County Health and Human Services Department and Shoreline Metro regarding transportation for elderly and disabled individuals and recommends adopting the resolution. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to receive the RO and adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Alderperson Boren. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I was wondering if uh, the, uh, somebody from the uh, Transit Commission could uh, uh, mention if there was any increase in reimbursement or and I realize a lot of this reimbursement is has to do with government entities and that type of thing but is there any increase increase in in revenue for the city or is this going to be pretty much the same as it has been can anyone answer that question I think I believe it stays the same about the same Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Seeing no other discussion, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Item 4.2 is RO number 168 of 1920 by the Mead Library Board of Trustees to whom was referred resolution number 168 of 1920 by Alderperson Donahue authorizing the creation of a Poet Laureate program in the city of Sheboygan and recommends adopting the resolution. Alderperson Donahue. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. I move to uh, receive the report and adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Items 4.3 through 4.5 will be referred to various committees under resolutions. Item 5.1 is resolution number 177 of 1920 by Alderpersons Wolf and Donahue authorizing the appropriate city officials to sign the 2020-21 agreement between the city of Sheboygan and the Sheboygan Professional Police Officers Supervisory Association for a successor contract. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to suspend the rules. Second. Is there any objection to suspension? Seeing no objection, please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Under discussion, Alderperson Bourne. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I read over the, uh, new, con the new proposed contract uh, yesterday, but I didn't have anything to compare it to the old contract, so I, w I would ask the city administrator, is there anything in this new contract that's different from the original con uh, contract, were we able to negotiate anything else with this group? And I, I understand the raises, I have no problem with that, but is there anything else in the language that changed from the previous contract? Uh, unfortunately, I do not have a copy of the contract in front of me, which identifies the uh, tentative agreements that are really the focus of uh, the changes that you're, you know, you're asking about. Well, who, 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 uh, who is in on the negotiations of this contract? Uh, I, I was included, uh, the HR director, and Chris Domagowski was involved. Chris, could you offer any information on this? Sure. There, there's basically really, it's just economic things. It was the raise, uh, a slight uh, increase in the amount they get for their vest so that they could um, replace that vest every five years. Um, and then just the residency that the fire fi firefighters had. I think those were really the three main topics. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Items uh, 5.2 and 5.3 will lay over, and items 5.4 and 5.5 will be referred to the Public Works Committee. Under reports of committees, item 6.1 is RC number 267 of 1920 by the Finance and Personnel Committee. To whom is referred RO number 156 of 1920 by the City Attorney, submitting for information a copy of the opinion issued by the Supreme Court of Wisconsin on February 14th of 2020 in the matter of Town of Wilson versus the City of Sheboygan case number 2018 AP 2162 and recommends filing the document. Alderperson Donahue. I move to uh, receive the report of the committee and file the document. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Item 6.2 is RC number 268 of 1920 by the Finance and Personnel Committee to whom was referred resolution number 167 of 1920 by Alderpersons Donahue and Bourne approving the project plan and establishing the boundaries for and the creation of tax incremental district number 20 in the city of Sheboygan, Wisconsin and recommends adopting the resolution. Alderperson Donahue. I move to uh, receive the report of the committee and adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? 
Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine ayes. Motion passes. Item 6.3 is RC number 269 of 1920 by the Public Works Committee. To whom was referred resolution number 169 of 1920 by Alderpersons Wolf and Sorensen, authorizing the Director of Public Works to enter into a contract with Grafe USA for the Quarry Park Master Plan and recommends adopting the resolution. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to receive the RC and adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. I have a motion on the floor under discussion. Alderperson Bourne. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Director Beeble, I read over this uh, proposal, but I didn't see a dollar amount in there for the contract. Did I miss that, or, or do you know what it's going to be for that contract with grief? Director Beeble. <clears throat> I was just looking for it myself. I, 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 we, we had budgeted around thirty thousand for this in the budget, and I believe it's around more so around twenty five thousand, not to exceed. So it shouldn't exceed the budget is what we're proposing. All right, thank you. Um, Parks Director Curlin, would you like to step up to the podium there and yeah, another comment? Yeah, it's kind of hard to see in there. It is a thousand. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Alderperson Bourne? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that, would the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> Nine eyes. Motion passes. Item 6.4 is RC number 270 of 1920 by the Public Works Committee. Tuma's referred direct referral resolution number 176 of 1920 by all the persons Wolf and Sorensen, authorizing the appropriate city officials to execute the Department of the Army right of way entry for construction document related to construction repairs on the South Breakwater and recommends adopting the resolution. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to receive the RC and adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Item 6.5 is RC number 271 of 1920 by the Finance and Personnel Committee. To whom was referred General Ordinance number 42 of 1920 by Alderpersons Donahue and Boren, repealing and recreating Chapter 82 of the Sheboygan Municipal Code relating to personnel regulations and benefits and recommends adopting the ordinance. Alderperson Donahue. Uh, I move to receive the report of the committee and adopt the ordinance. Thank you for that motion and support. Under discussion. Seeing no discussion, would the clerk please call the roll? Nine ayes. Motion passes. Under other uh, matters authorized by law, I'll turn it over to City Attorney Charles Adams. 7.1 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending December 31, 2020, June 30, 2020, and June 30, 2021. That will be referred to the Licensing Hearing and Public Safety Committee. 7.2 is a resolution by Alderpersons Wolf and Sorensen authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a lease purchase agreement with Bell Bank Equipment Finance to finance the purchase of a 2020 Vactor 2100i VAC excavator truck with 2020 Freightliner 114 SD chassis. That will be referred to the Public Works Committee. 7.3 is a resolution by Alderpersons Wolf and Sorensen authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract with Dorner Incorporated regarding street and utility replacement on Geely Avenue from Calumet Drive to North 23rd Street and milling of Seaman Avenue from North 21st Street to North 25th Street. 
That will also be referred to the Public Works Committee. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you for your time tonight.